the Top End, one of the last remaining true wildernesses in the world. It's a landscape blessed with incredible escarpments towering over its savanna and its wetlands. A formidable wet season that brings life to the land. The immense water carves its way through country, rivers and spectacular waterfalls. It is home to the most hostile and ancient of predators, evolved perfectly over millennia. It is an environment that is pressured towards the brave and the wary. But in a place bustling of life like here, the bursts of colour from the animals and the plants. Most of the time, the magic is found when you look smaller. Insects are the building blocks of our ecosystems. They are the providers, the pollinators and the cleaners. And none are more important than the ants. So my name is Francois Brassard and I'm a PhD student at Charles Darwin University. Here I came about a year and a half ago to study the ant biodiversity of Australia. And my project focuses more on the effects of fire and vegetation on the ant species abundance, richness and composition. So Darwin is amazing because here we're really lucky to have ants that's just at the doorstep. So for me, what's most exciting about uh, doing research here is just the sheer diversity that I get to encounter. So there's more ants in the plot that I've been sampling, which are just a few actors, than in the whole of Canada. Every time I go out, I might have a new discovery. And also what's great about this is that there's so much of it that is still undescribed. So there's so much work to be done um, to know really what's out there, because at this point, we don't, um, and it's quite exciting to be uh, learning a bit more about that, but also making the community learn more about the diversity of the top end, which is just fabulous. So there is this fire experiment that's been going at the Territory Wildlife Park, and they started in 2003, and over there they've got plots that burn at different um, frequencies, so either they'll be burning very often, or not very often, or not even at all. And these plots are great because I can then go inside each of them and sample ants and look at what are the differences in abundance, richness and composition between these plots. Here in the top end, we're in the tropical savannas and it burns a lot and very often. And usually what fire will do is that it's going to modify the habitat uh, by making it more open. So if a fire goes through the savanna, usually it burns a lot of material and makes it uh, change it from a more close habitat to a more open habitat and this will have potentially massive repercussions on the animals that live there and so if we find that for instance different fire regime will promote different species um, then if we want to inform a fire management practice that will want to conserve the most species possible then we would want to use a mix of different fire regimes so leaving for instance patches that will never burn and patches that will burn often because there's ants that prefer the forest, their ants will prefer the savanna. So the golden standard in sampling ants is actually very simple. We use pitfall traps. You just use any sort of container. And then what we do is that we dug it uh, just under the ground and uh, we make it so that the opening of the pitfall trap is flush with the ground. So once that's done, we open it and then we put a preservative. And what we use here is funnily enough, car coolant, because it's one of the only thing that will preserve ants, but also not evaporate in the hot conditions that are around that one. And so once we've got this pitfall traps that's active, uh, we leave it open for about 48 hours. And then when we come back, we just put a cap on top of it. And uh, we should have had collected uh, several ants that just walked in and fell into the trap. So after going to the field, and I bring back my samples to the lab, and that's where the real lengthy work starts. So I'll be taking out the specimens from the traps that we have, and then I'll be sorting them first to 
more for species, trying to find out what they are, but really what I'll need to do eventually, because there's just so many species, is that I'll need to put them on point mounts and then identify them under the microscope. Where I work at the wildlife park, we've got over 150 species. So that's gonna be the core of the work. And then we've got a final list. And then I can use this in, um, with some statistical models to then learn more about how fire affects diversity. So another thing that I do when I get back to the lab is that I will be selecting some specimens of each of the species that we've identified. And then I'll be looking at them with a high resolution imaging microscope. And I'll be taking some in-depth images showing the ants in really close up focus and in high resolution. And with this, uh, not only it's a great tool to identify species, but I can also take really precise measurements in their morphology and then ask questions such as, does the morphology of ants, uh, is it affected by fire or by vegetation or some other factor? So ants, because of their abundance, they are super important across the ecosystems of the world. And so one way that they will be important is just because ants interact with so many other species. So one example of this if you go into the bush and look for it, you're going to see that ants actually interact with plants and with little sap-sucking insects. So take, for example, our iconic green tree ants. They sometimes interact with other insects in a way that's basically like farming them. So there's a lot of insects that will eat sap. And the thing with sap is that there's very little nitrogen in it. So the insect needs to feed on a lot of it if they want to get enough resources to grow. But the problem with sap is that there's a lot of sugar in it. There's actually too much. So these insects will try to expel that sugar. And that's great for the ants because ants love sugar. So what they'll do is that the ants will be collecting the sugar and then in exchange, they'll want to protect this resource. So they'll protect all the little sap sucking bugs such as aphids or even sometimes caterpillars in exchange for their sugar. And so in this relationship, it's a win-win because uh, the little insect gets protection and then the ants uh, get some sugar. So this type of relationship of exchanging protection uh, for sugar is not unique to aphids. There's actually plenty of different species that will do so. For instance, there's several caterpillars that will do the same thing. There's even a whole family of butterflies that either rely a lot or a little bit with ants in order to survive. And that's because caterpillars of this family are um, pretty defenseless. And so on one range of this relationship, there's some of the caterpillars that will offer sugar to get protection from the ants, just like aphids. So in exchange for sugar, um, the ants protect them and then the caterpillar survival is going to be much higher. I'm Alan Anderson, I'm an ant ecologist. I've been working on ants since I was an honours student at Monash University way back in 1986. I came up here to Darwin to join CSIRO uh, and uh, I was at CSIRO for 30 years and then I've been at CDU here for the last uh, five or, or six years specialising on ants my entire career and uh, a bit of bonanza coming up here because as I've found out uh, over the years we're sitting here in the centre of the global hotspot for ant diversity. And it's one of the best kept secrets because the majority of our ants up here are undescribed. And so it's only as we've built up, we've built up a massive collection over these years, 8,000 species. Um, over 90% are undescribed and we've spent a lot of the last um, five or 10 years uh, just documenting how diverse the um, ants are up here, um, just incredibly diverse, way, way more compared to any, anywhere else in the world under a similar climate. So if you ask any ant ecologist where are the most diverse places in the world, they'll always say, well, lowland tropical rainforest, and particularly the Amazon, 
and uh, we don't know exactly how many ant species occur in the Amazon, but the best, the best guess at the moment is about 2,000 species. And um, ant diversity in rainforests is, generally, way, way higher than in sort of other habitats, including the, the non-rainforest habitats in the, tropics, the, the tropical savannas. And just to give you some idea, the Brazilian savannas, their Cerrado, a huge biome about the size of the Amazon, nearly as big as the Amazon, um, has got about 700 species compared to the couple of thousand in the Amazon. Still, so still a lot. And um, well, here's a figure for Australia's savanna zone. Um, I think it's 5,000 species and keeps climbing. Every time we go out and survey more ants and have a closer look at them, that figure just keeps on going up and up and up. And so it's just incredible hyperdiversity here in our savanna landscapes compared with any other parts um, of the world. To these sorts of figures that you can just never, never see anywhere um, else in the world. So, you know, we are in a, in a really special place um, here in Monsoon, Australia. One really great development over the last decade or so is the genetic revolution. And so now we're able to sequence and DNA barcode um, a lot of our specimens, and that's just um, provided really valuable information on, on how diverse our fauna is. And so we've barcoded 10 or 10,000 um, individual ants from across the north. And the idea here is that because ants are so important in, in ecosystems and they're so well connected with everything else in an ecosystem, whether it's the soils or whether it's the plants or other animals, the idea is if we know what ants are doing, because they're so well connected and so important, that's giving us an indication of what the broader ecosystem is doing. And so whether it's using ants to tell us what the ecological impacts of a disturbance might be, your fire or grazing, or how well an ecosystem is being restored, we look at the ants and we, we compare ants at the either restored site or the disturbed site and look at the species that occur there and compare them with the species that occur in the reference undisturbed sites. And the difference gives us an indication of either how, how well it's restored or how much impact that disturbance has had. And, and so most of the mine sites here across northern Australia have had ant monitoring programs um, using ants to assess just how well they've restored the ecosystem after mining. Uh, my name is Alison Malpartida and I'm a PhD candidate at Charles Darwin University. My topic is looking at ecosystem restoration of mine sites and using terrestrial invertebrates to monitor for restoration. Terrestrial invertebrates are one of the most understudied elements of restoration ecology, even though they are one of the most important indicators of restoration as they play many ecologically uh, important roles, such as soil formation, litter decomposition, nutrient cycling, and they are sensitive to environmental change. It's hard to study these insects because sample processing is so time consuming and identification requires specialist taxonomic expertise. This is where genetics can help with species identification. Once validated, a metabarcoding protocol can be used by different groups or research organisations to identify species quite quickly. They involve extracting DNA out of the environment and using next generation sequencing to determine what species is present in the environment. DNA metabarcoding looks at all of these different barcodes that come from a single sample and simultaneously looks at all the species that are present in that one sample. Its success depends on well-developed DNA reference databases, uh, which are currently lacking for quite a few species. So we can do this for ants and termites because Alan has been developing a CO1 database with over 5,000 gene sequences. Uh, and for termites, there are only about 50 termites in the Northern Territory and about half already have their mitochondrial genome sequenced. So part of my project will be to complete the termite database and continue adding on to the ant database as we move through the project. This project is being funded by supervising scientists. They are responsible for the 
rehabilitation of mines within the Alligator Rivers region. So they plan to use the technology from this project for long-term monitoring at Ranger, which means that scientists can monitor for ants and termites long-term across these different mine sites. One way to monitor how mine site rehabilitation is going using these bioindicators is to look at the different disturbance types and how they compare to the reference sites. These reference sites are undisturbed areas surrounding the mine sites and can provide a baseline to what the mine looked like before mining occurred. As DNA sequencing gets cheaper and cheaper, just like computers with Moore's Law, we can see monitoring expanding to all environments and will be really useful for biodiversity conservation in the future. It's a quick method for how you can monitor whole ecosystems using just a few samples. It will significantly cut back the labour time to do these surveys and also the cost. And this will help to conserve uh, environments and ecosystems well into the future.